The 1955 Chevrolets. New look, new life, new everything. Well, that was an absolutely true statement as the 1955 Chevrolets, while they would share the same 115-inch wheelbase as the outgoing 1954 models, were all new from the ground up. Not just the styling, but the chassis and what was under hood in some cases, namely the new 265 cubic inch V8, were all new components and combined to make the 1955 Chevrolet an American icon. And on October 28, 1954, Chevrolet 7600 nationwide dealers debuted the beautiful 1955 Chevrolet to the buying public. It would go on to become one of the most successful automobiles of all time, selling about 1.7 million units. That's right. This Chevrolet, there really was no full-size or intermediate class back at this point, but the 55 Chevrolets sold 1.7 million units. And at the time, Chevrolet division had about one out of every four cars on the road. They had a market share of 25%, just Chevrolet. Forget about Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac. Today, General Motors' total market share in the U.S., I believe, is around 16 17%. So back then, Chevrolet had more market share than GM did in total. Now, the story of the 1955 Chevrolets is a unique one, for it would really take a confluence of factors to make this car so successful. And the principal reason behind its success was that the individuals behind the 55 Chevrolet, whether that they were designers or engineers, really were top-notch and knew that this vehicle was going to be a knockout and wanted to make it a knockout. More specifically, General Motors Styling was headed at the time by Harley Earl, although the Chevrolet studio was headed by a gentleman named Claire McKeegan, who was appointed chief designer of Chevrolet in 1953. And McKeegan would continue as the chief designer for Chevrolet all the way through the 1964 model year, after which he would hand the reins over to Irv Rubicki, who would execute the 1965 Chevrolets. And while the design team was talented, the engineers were also highly talented that worked on the 1955 Chevrolet, more specifically Ed Cole, who had later become Chevrolet's general manager and even GM president, was at the time Chevrolet's chief engineer. It hadn't been that long since Ed Cole and his assistant Harry Barr had worked over at Cadillac designing the overhead valve V8 for the 1949 Cadillacs. Their goal was then to put a similarly robust and powerful overhead valve power plant under hood in the 1955 Chevrolets to make sure that the cars didn't just look good, but they also had the appropriate amount of horsepower that customers were requiring during this time frame. And certainly, Ed Cole and Harry Barr delivered on that mission with their 265 cubic inch V8 that made up to 180 horsepower in 1955. And that propelled these vehicles from 0 to 60 in under 10 seconds, which for the time was extremely fast. But let's begin with some of the styling, and then we'll get into more on the mechanicals associated with the 1955 Chevrolet. First, we have some sketches here done by Carl Renner in the early 1950s, and you can see they somewhat predict the 1955 Chevrolet. The overall greenhouse and wraparound windshield is somewhat similar to the final production version, but obviously the front end is very different of the 1955 Chevrolet, which ended up with really more of a Ferrari-like egg crate grill and look to it. And that was dictated, according to Claire McKeegan, by Harley Earl at the time, who had spent quite a bit of time in Europe and wanted to bring back some of that European high-end flair to Chevrolet for 1955. Here's another sketch by Carl Renner that you see a little bit of that belt line kink in this particular sketch that would make it through to the final production, giving the car a bit of dimension. But again, of course, the front end with the so-called Dagmar-like bumpers was not to be and looked very different from the final version. Here we have some other early front end treatments that were explored for the 55 Chevrolet, all pretty heavy and chunky. Look at this one here with, I don't know what's going on beneath the headlamps. And then the bumper itself looks like it weighs several hundred pounds and maybe it even does in this application. Just very heavy handed overall, kind of in keeping with Harley Earl styling that you would see on the later 50s cars that he would do like the 58 Oldsmobiles and Buicks before retiring 
from General Motors design. Here's also a proposal for the 55 Chevrolet with that type of front end and a cost-saving split windshield up front, which was thankfully later dropped. But you can see this car doesn't have that belt line kink to it, and the front end, although it kind of leans forward with those headlights that stick out proud of the turn signals, it just, again, looks quite heavy-handed. And as Bill Mitchell would say, the chrome was put on with a trowel up front. Thankfully, designers restrained themselves in designing the final version of the 55 Chevrolet, which really had minimal chrome. And that was a stark contrast to what was the trend, at least over at the General Motors School of Design, if you will, for the time. Something that many don't know, but what McKeegan once recounted, was that there actually were two proposals for the 55 Chevrolet that were shown to the board of directors at the Proving Ground. One was the final version of the car with the egg crate grill and the so-called Ferrari-esque front end. It does kind of look Ferrari-esque. That's what McKeegan actually called it and said what the inspiration was for the vehicle. And the other was actually a car that was wider and lower than the final 1955 Chevrolet, in keeping with the typical design dictum of longer, lower, wider. Interestingly, the board ended up picking the narrower car with the Ferrari-esque front end, and that's what made it through to production. And quite a handsome car, I would say. It was and remains to this day. In fact, perhaps it was the good looks of the 55 Chevrolet, as well as the mechanicals, that allowed Chevy to set a one-day production record on May 31st, 1955, when 10,172 passenger cars and trucks were produced in that single day. And in July, Chevrolet would produce 53,510 units in a week. Just one week, 53,510 units. So why was the car so successful aside from the styling? Well, one reason was that there was a pretty robust model lineup of the 1955 Chevrolets. Many know the top-of-the-line Bel Air series. Recall that there was no Impala by this point. It would be in 1958 that the Impala was introduced. But there was the Bel Air that came in the convertible form, the hardtop sport coupe form with no pillar, as well as a two- and four-door sedan, and a Nomad two-door wagon and the Beauville four-door station wagon. Beneath that was the 210 series. That had the Sport Coupe, the two-door hardtop, as well as the four-door sedan, two-door sedan, the 210 Delray Club Coupe, the Townsman four-door station wagon, and my favorite name, the 210 Handyman two-door station wagon, which had a different roof line, by the way, from the Bel Air Nomad. And then at the bottom end of the ladder was the 150 series that came in four-door, two-door sedan, utility sedan, which was the super cheap version, and then the 150 handyman two-door wagon. So what was the price differential between these vehicles at the time? Well, your 150, the cheapest vehicle was the utility sedan, which retailed for $1,593. It's about the equivalent of eighteen dollars to $19,000 today. And that, again, that was the cheapest Chevrolet at the time. And then at the upper end, the most expensive vehicle that was offered by Chevrolet 1955 was actually not the convertible, which retailed for $2,206, the Bel Air convertible. It was the Bel Air Nomad Wagon, which retailed for $2,472, which would be about $27,000, $28,000 in today's dollars. And that's why only 8,386 Nomad Wagons were likely sold. Imagine you had to pay a premium over even a convertible for just a two-door wagon. Well, I guess it was a stylish wagon, but if you were looking for a true wagon, you probably just went with the regular old handyman or the Bel Air Beauville wagon, both of which sold much more than the Nomad two-door wagon. Now, as previously mentioned, one of the great things about the 55 Chevrolet was that it introduced the Chevrolet small block. Yes, the venerable Chevrolet small block, which would grow to become the popular Chevrolet 350 cubic inch V8 and grow as large as 400 cubic inches in the 1970s, was engineered by Ed Cole as well as his assistant, Harry Barr. 
And in order to execute this, Chevrolet engineering really ballooned in size. They went from having about 850 employees to 2,900 because it wasn't just an all-new engine under hood, but this 1955 Chevrolet had an all-new frame, a perimeter frame, as well as all-new suspension. The front suspension was entirely new, got rid of kingpins in favor of ball joints, and the rear end in the suspension was also all-new that now employed Hotchkiss drive as opposed to the old torque tube design. The result was that the 1955 Chevrolets, if you've ever driven one, actually had this beautifully flat and smooth ride that Chevrolet at some point would market as the quadrupoise ride. Well, it was truly quite revolutionary. And if you get the opportunity to ride in or drive one of these 55 Chevrolets, you'll see that no matter what bumps the car goes over, the car just doesn't pitch or roll at all. It's a beautifully flat ride. And it really doesn't nosedive upon braking either, which was something that a lot of cars did for the time. Now, as I mentioned, the 55 Chevrolet's 265 cubic inch V8 would later go on to become the very, very famous small block engine. But even in 1955, it had a great reputation after a few teething problems were worked out. The 265 had a 3.75-inch bore as well as a 3-inch stroke, leading to an over-square design, and it was a highly compact and efficiently sized engine as well as efficient from a weight perspective. In fact, the engine weighed 40 pounds less than Chevrolet's Blue Flame six-cylinder engine, which came in a couple different forms. One was a 123-horsepower version. The other was a 136-horsepower version. I should mention that the 265 VA did have 180 horsepower in top form when it had a four-barrel carburetor, but there was a two-barrel version that made 162 horsepower. So with all new looks, all new suspension, all new chassis, and all new V8 underhood, which by the way, a buyer could opt for for an extremely modest sum of around $100 at the time. It was actually $99. And you can compare that to some of the other option content. The Power Glide was $178. Power Brakes were $38. Power Steering was $92. So for the price of power steering, you could get a V8 underhood. And that's perhaps why over 40% of buyers selected a V8 underhood in their 1955 Chevrolet. Maybe even more would have selected that, but I think the V8 demand ended up catching Chevrolet off guard, and they ended up not being able to produce the mix that they wanted of V8s relative to customer demand. And I have to say that while the exterior of the 1955 Chevrolets was especially handsome, the interiors were too. Notice you have a little bit of the Chevrolet twin cockpit theme here that was popular in the Corvette. You have the speedometer on the driver's side, and then, well, just some fancy instrument panel shape on the passenger side. But at the same time, the interior was quite handsome. It did have some new functionality. More specifically, the clutch and brake pedals were hinged from above as opposed to going into the floor. And the accelerator pedal no longer had a rod that went directly through the floor behind it. So there was some greater functionality in the interior to accompany the good looks. And an interesting little tidbit, if you ordered a Bel Air, your dash came with all these little Chevrolet bow ties all across it. And in fact, there were 987 of those bow ties, just to remind you that you were sitting in a wonderful new Chevrolet. And perhaps the 1955 Chevrolet was the best Chevrolet in terms of delivering to the everyday man or woman a little bit of a Cadillac, if you will. I just mentioned that Ed Cole and Harry Barr were both Cadillac engine engineers on the 1949 Cadillac overhead valve V8, and they're the ones who designed the Chevrolet small block that was under hood. And the all-new chassis and riding components and suspension really helped the 1955 Chevrolets ride better than other cars on the road, and certainly than the vehicles that they replaced. In the end, as I mentioned, Chevrolet would sell about 1.7 million cars for the model year, taking 23% of the market and inching out Ford for that model year. Of course, 55 would be the first year in the 55, 56, 57 Chevrolet Trio, all designed by Claire McKeegan and all highly successful. We'll spend a separate episode on the 1957 Chevrolet because I think it's just one that's an absolute American icon. 
Now, one other little tidbit of trivia that I'll share with you if you're wondering is, well, why in the world did these particular vehicles, like the 55 Chevrolet and those before it, have such high trunks? Was that just the styling of the time? Or was that something that was dictated for other reasons? Well, the truth of the matter was that Chevrolet engineers during this time frame had a standard that those big milk jugs, farmer's milk jugs, had to be able to be carried in the trunk of the vehicle standing upright. And so that was actually a standard that Chevrolet engineers had. That is no joke. And so it led to this relatively high deck lid on the 55 Chevrolets in a large trunk, which is not a bad thing. The car looks handsome, but perhaps the designers would have wanted something different, and clearly as time went on, that standard would be relaxed. But Chevrolet did sell a lot of vehicles to farmers during the time. And remember, a lot of America was associated with agriculture. So that was a real constraint that they had to design around. And it's one of the reasons why the 1955 Chevrolet looks the way that it does, particularly out back. In any case, this 55 Chevrolet or the so-called Junior Cadillac was just a gem, and I hope that you enjoyed learning a little bit more about it. What's the cool fact that you learned about this 1955 Chevrolet that you didn't know before? Put a comment in the comment section. Thanks again for watching.